good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, briefing uh, focusing on Israel's uh, parliamentary elections, uh, both in terms of domestic and uh, regional implication. My name is Khalid Jachan. I'm executive director of Arab Center. I'd like to welcome you uh, to uh, this uh, briefing. We have a special guest today, uh, Dr. Hanna uh, Swaid, uh, joining us. Uh, <clears throat> and um, before I introduce him, uh, let me say that we will basically be following a slightly different format uh, this week. Uh, it will be in the format of a conversation, essentially, uh, with Dr. Swaid. And uh, what we will do is uh, give uh, Dr. Swade uh, about 10 minutes, 12 minutes to brief us about the latest results uh, that have been confirmed uh, with regard to the uh, Israeli elections and some of his uh, uh, comments uh, on, uh, <clears throat> on these uh, results. And then I'll uh, pass the microphone on to my colleague, Dr. Yusuf Munayer. Uh, seated here uh, with me, who will begin the conversation uh, by also giving a few remarks and then uh, begin the Q&A or the question, uh, the conversation, excuse me, uh, with Dr. Uh, uh, Swade. I will moderate the event and occasionally might be asking a question or two uh, myself. Uh, toward the end of the conversation, we will open the floor uh, for uh, questions from the audience. So these cards that are in front of you or on your seats, if you need one, just raise your hand, staff will pass one to you. Uh, please indicate your name, affiliation, and di direct your question either to our uh, guest uh, on the screen or, uh, or here uh, in, the, uh, in the room. Um, let me um, move forward and introduce uh, our uh, guest today. Uh, Dr. Hanna Swade is, is a good friend, I'll have to say that, uh, from many, many years ago. Uh, uh, he lives in uh, Eilabun, in the Galilee area of Israel today. And uh, I uh, happen to be fortunate to have actually taught for a couple of years, uh, way back uh, in a previous incarnation, uh, at the, the school there, help uh, with uh, starting a, an American school, actually. Uh, in Ha'ilabun called Galilee Christian High School uh, that served uh, several uh, Palestinian villages in the Galilee area that had no uh, high school at the time. We're talking about the 60s. Uh, so uh, it was a pleasure uh, uh, knowing Hanna from his high school days, actually, and uh, knowing his family very, very well. There is a family connection here, uh, and, and uh, we are delighted to have him uh, join us uh, today. Uh, like I said, uh, Dr. Swade is uh, a resident of Ailaboun uh, in Israel. He uh, is uh, essentially a, a civil engineer uh, by training. He get, got his uh, BSc, MSc, and doctorate uh, degree from the Technion, uh, Israel foremost uh, tech uh, uh, school uh, in Haifa. And uh, he, his specialization is uh, urban planning. Uh, he has also been involved in politics. Uh, he did uh, uh, chair the uh, city council. He was mayor uh, of Ailaboun for uh, uh, several years uh, before he ran for the Israeli Knesset as a member of parliament, uh, representing, uh, uh, of course, the Arab community uh, in general uh, in, in Israel. And uh, during the, uh, he served in the 17th, 18th, and 19th. Uh, Knesset. Uh, right now, the elections we just witnessed are, I think, the 23rd uh, Knesset. So he, uh, uh, between 2009 and, and 2015, uh, he served in uh, three different sessions uh, in the Knesset. And then he resigned in uh, 2015 to make room for some young blood, younger blood, uh, uh, to uh, participate uh, in what has become uh, as the Arab joint list uh, today that has achieved a big political uh, victory in a way uh, on Monday uh, by securing uh, 15 or 16 uh, seats. It remains to be uh, confirmed over the next uh, few days. During his tenure uh, at the Knesset, again, because of his reputation and because of his uh, career specialty, he served on several key committees, actually, uh, in the Knesset. He served as a member of the Economic Affairs Committee, uh, which is a prestigious uh, membership. 
He served on the Constitution, uh, Law, and Justice Committee of the Knesset. He chaired the subcommittee on the development of green energy. Uh, environmental issues are key, uh, important issues for him, and has been he's been very vocal in the country as a whole on this issue. And he also served on the very important uh, ethics uh, committee uh, in the uh, Knesset. In addition, he's been involved uh, in the uh, kind of NGO community. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Suede uh, has uh, founded and uh, currently is the chair of the board uh, of the uh, uh, Arab Center for Alternative Planning that focuses on the future of uh, community planning uh, inside Israel for the Arab communities, Arab cities and Arab villages. Uh, as you know, this issue is extremely important uh, for uh, Arabs who happen to be inside or living as Israeli uh, citizens. Um, he has lectured actually in uh, different universities while traveling, but also lectured at the University of Reading in, in, in England between 90 uh, and 93. And he's a member of the National Council for Planning uh, and uh, or has been a member of the National Council for planning and construction in Israel. Uh, he served there in 95 to uh, 2003. Uh, as I said, he's a key figure, uh, even though he did not run this time uh, for, for a position in, in the Knesset or membership in the Knesset, but he's a key member uh, of the, uh, one of the senior or main components of the join list, uh, the Democratic Front, uh, which is uh, very, predominant in uh, politics, particularly uh, in the uh, north and throughout the country, uh, indeed. Uh, and uh, I'm sure he has some interesting ideas to share with us with regards to the results of the elections and his own commentary on those results and their significance. Uh, Dr. Swade, welcome. And uh, please go ahead and uh, proceed with your introductory remarks, and then uh, you will be followed by Yusuf's uh, remarks, and then we will engage in conversation afterwards. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Khalil, for this generous uh, introduction. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be with you to share you this uh, uh, this event. Um, indeed, the elections, the general elections, uh, took place a few days ago on the uh, March the 2nd, and uh, we have almost uh, final results already. Um, uh, I think that the major, uh, the main result of these elections for the Palestinian citizens of Israel uh, is that uh, the joint list, which is uh, combined uh, of uh, four major Arab uh, parties or political movements uh, won 15 seats. For the first time, the Arab rep representation in the Israeli Knesset is up to 15 uh, members. Uh, in the uh, previous elections, which took place about one year ago, in uh, uh, April uh, last week, last year, there were two uh, major Arab lists uh, who went together uh, 10 seats. In the second run in September, there was a joint list again, because previously, a few years ago, uh, starting 2015, there was one joint list. Uh, which dissolved to two, as I said, uh, last April, and then joined again to a joint list in September. Together, uh, uh, the joint list uh, won uh, 13 seats. These elections, as a result of a uh, huge, I would say, turnout uh, of the Arab citizens, uh, the Palestinians in Israel, there are several reasons for that. We won. 15 seats. And as I said, this is the maximum representation of the Palestinian citizens in the Israeli uh, Knesset. For the Arab, uh, for the Palestinian minority in Israel, that's actually the most important result of these uh, elections. Uh, of course, 
this result will have different implications, which uh, probably we could talk about uh, later on. But let me give you also the other results. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Likud party uh, headed by uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, actually won 36 uh, seats. Uh, the second largest party, uh, Blue White, that's Gantz, uh, won 33 uh, seats. And then, of course, as I said, the joint list with 15 joint list is the, is the third largest uh, faction in the Knesset. And then we have the remaining uh, parties, Shas, which represents the uh, Sephardi Jews, won 19 uh, seats. And then we have the Ishkenazi uh, ultra-Orthodox party, uh, which won seven uh, seats. Uh, and then we have a, a Lieberman, uh, this, um, you know, um, politician who was once part of the Israeli uh, right wing, is now having his own uh, party, Israel Betenu, Israel Our Home, with seven seats as well. And uh, the Labour Party, with a coalition with Meretz, which is the Zionist left in Israel, they won seven uh, seats. And at the end, we have Bete uh, uh, Yemina. Uh, that's the party of the Defense Minister Bennett, which is the extreme right uh, wing party with six seats. So uh, the most important thing in Israel is that is everything is divided into two camps. One is the extreme uh, right, the hardcore uh, right with 58, that includes uh, the Likud, uh, Shas, and the ultra-Orthodox Haredi uh, party, and Yemina with 58 uh, seats. Uh, on the other side, the center, and I would say the soft right and the Arab uh, members of the Knesset with 54. And then there are uh, seven members uh, which represent the Israel Betenu, uh, Lieberman. Lieberman, as I said, used to be uh, belong to the uh, right, right wing uh, parties, but recently he split with Netanyahu and he's standing in the middle between the extreme right wing parties and the moderate or the soft right parties. So we have uh, 58 and we have uh, 55 and we have seven uh, in the middle. Uh, Netanyahu actually, uh, the same night of the elections, uh, he declared that he won these elections, but it was premature. Everybody knows that now it's premature. He cannot now, uh, now set up uh, a government because of course, uh, the blue and white and the other center left parties do not want to, jo to join a party or a government led by Netanyahu because of the accusations, because of the charges of corruption. Uh, so, uh, and with 58 seats in the Knesset supporting Netanyahu, he cannot set up a government. And uh, recently, uh, Israel Beteno and Lieberman was declaring and announcing openly that he's not going, that uh, the era of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is, uh, has ended and he's not going to support him under no circum circumstances to set up the new government. So there is a stalemate now and everybody is uh, waiting for you know, the consultations which the president of the state should hold with the different uh, parties. Uh, I believe that the Likud and the right-wing parties with uh, ultra-Orthodox parties will, um, will nominate uh, Netanyahu to set up the government with the 58, as I said, 
And on the other side, I believe that uh, both the blue and white party and the Labour Party will uh, will ask the president to uh, allow Benny Gantz to set up the government. I'm not sure. We have not decided so far how is the position of the uh, joint list, the Arab list, let's call it, uh, despite the fact that there is one Jewish member in the joint list. But of course, it drew most of its uh, votes from the Arab population. Probably I will elaborate on that later on because more and more Jews are voting also for the joint list in the, in the last elections because they have don't they don't have any substitute or any other option among the Jewish uh, parties. These are the Israeli left. Some of them Zionists, some of them not. So um, I would say that, uh, uh, that it's not. Or in the previous in the previous run in September, the joint list consulted or asked the president to let Benny Gantz, blue and white, to set up the government. But because of different uh, declarations and different policies and positions, which were which uh, Benny Gantz actually adopted during the campaign, we are not sure anymore that we are going to repeat that. Uh, and ask the president to allow him to establish the uh, new government. So we are now in a situation where there is a stalemate. Uh, it's not clear how things are going to develop, but probably this is another thing that I will elaborate on later on. Thanks, Khalil. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Swade, for your um, uh, opening remarks, uh, which were very mm -hmm. insightful. Um, I, I want to just speak a little bit about what, what, what I see as sort of the main takeaway from the results that we saw, uh, and, and I know we'll have more of a discussion about the um, uh, specific uh, outcome for Palestinian citizens of Israel on the joint list, but I wanted to sort of focus my comments on the, the big picture uh, result here in this battle that has been going on between the uh, current prime minister, current Israeli prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu and the main uh, opposition party, the Blue and White Party, that has been uh, led by uh, Benjamin Gantz. Um, this is the third election that we see in a year uh, in Israel. Uh, and after three elections, we are not in a fundamentally different political place than we were in November of 2018, uh, when Avigdor Lieberman, then with a handful of, of seats or so, uh, decided to leave the Netanyahu government, making it uh, very unstable with a, a slim uh, majority uh, and setting the uh, Israeli political system on the path uh, to uh, new elections. Uh, and uh, since then, what we have seen playing out, which has been one of the most important and defining dynamics of the campaigns that we saw between Netanyahu uh, and uh, Gantz's parties, uh, is the issue of Netanyahu's legal situation. And you will recall that in late 2018, uh, for uh, the first time ever, uh, Israeli police recommended to the attorney general uh, in Israel that Benjamin Netanyahu, the sitting prime minister, uh, be charged with criminal offenses that included uh, fraud, bribery, breach of trust, and, uh, and so on. Um, and, you know, what what we saw play out in the campaigns is that Netanyahu and Gantz each made two very different bets about the Israeli electorate. The bet that Benjamin Gantz made uh, and that his party made was that if they can make the election, and it ended up being multiple elections, a referendum on Netanyahu's fitness to serve as prime minister based on his troubles with the law, based on his willingness to undermine what they consider democratic principles. If they can make the election a referendum on that, then they would end up winning a majority of Israelis and ultimately dislodge Netanyahu from power uh, and end his uh, time as the longest serving prime minister in Israeli history. Benjamin Netanyahu made the opposite bet. He made a bet that if he can make his campaign about the core tenets of Zionism, which are essentially 
anti-Arabism and expansionism into Palestinian territory, colonial expansion, that the Israeli electorate will view those things as more important than any, uh, you know, questions around his, uh, you know, his, his fitness uh, and his legal status and democratic principles. Uh, and I think, you know, what we saw, and you saw this in, in Gantz's campaign in an effort to really isolate this question, to make it a referendum, they did not, as uh, Dr. Suede alluded to, really provide an alternative for Israeli voters on issues related to the question of peace or related to Palestinians. In fact, what the Gantz campaign, campaign attempted to do, what the blue and white list attempted to do is say to Israeli voters, we are everything that you like about Benjamin Netanyahu, except for those, one, those few things that you don't like around his legal troubles, around his willingness to seek immunity, around his willingness to undermine the, the, the democratic process. We saw that with their uh, you know, position on the Jordan Valley. We saw that on their position towards the uh, Trump plan. Uh, we saw this in their position on Israeli settlements, which is not fundamentally different than the position of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party. And of course, to combat the attacks that would uh, inevitably come from Netanyahu and the right uh, about the blue and white party being weak and too soft on Palestinians and so on, uh, the party became a party of Israeli military generals. And you saw three different Israeli military generals at the forefront of the party to really provide this perception that, no, we are a strong alternative. And the only difference here uh, is really on this question uh, of uh, ethics and democratic principles and so on. And the outcome has been clear here time and again. Uh, I think that Netanyahu won the bet. And I think the outcome of this election and obviously, there's a lot of news transpiring today in Israel. There's going to be a uh, horse race and jockeying and so on for forming a coalition government. Um, but for a sitting prime minister who is facing criminal indictment and who's supposed to have a trial begin, I think, in 10 days from now, right, after these elections, uh, to not only be a viable uh, candidate to form a government, but to actually have the largest margin over the blue and white party as a result of this election than he's had in any of the previous elections shows, I think, that Netanyahu's gamble ended up paying off here very, very clearly. And I think what this speaks to is, is, is really about a, a central ethos in the Israeli electorate and really Israeli society. And, I, and this is why I think it's so important that this question of Palestinian citizens of Israel is really centered in the discussion today. Uh, and that's that within Israeli society, Zionism has always trumped democratic principles since the foundation of the state. And so Netanyahu made a bet that if presented with these two alternatives, that Israelis will fall in line with the position that Zionist goals, Zionist aspirations are far more important than democratic principles, even if those democratic principles are impacting uh, Jewish Israelis as well. Uh, Israelis have historically made that calculation, and I think have made that calculation uh, once uh, again today. Uh, and I think you see this playing out in some of the rhetoric that uh, has come from Netanyahu and the Likud party, not just in the aftermath of this election, but in the aftermath of the last election as, uh, as well, is that they are arguing that we have won the Jewish vote, right? We have won a Jewish majority, as if to say that those are the votes that matter, right? Uh, and I think, um, you know, what, what this really speaks to uh, is that he is making the argument that it is only those votes that matter. And it is a country where it is the Jewish citizens that really need to be making a decision about the future. Uh, and, and thus, that's the debate that Israeli society needs to have. Uh, but for me, I think that is the most striking takeaway uh, for a prime minister that is in the situation that he's in to come away with the result that he's had really speaks to the priorities of Israeli society. Uh, thank you, Yusuf. Appreciate those uh, frank uh, and challenging uh, remarks. Uh, let me begin the conversation with Dr. Swade. 
by asking him a couple of kind of both uh, personal uh, questions, but related to the general uh, electoral system uh, in Israel. Uh, Dr. Swade, uh, I know personally that uh, you know uh, President Reuven Rivlin uh, rather well. You've dealt with him uh, on many occasions. You've had some uh, private meetings uh, with him uh, before. I was a bit surprised the other day, uh, Monday, after he was coming out of the voting booth, he made the following remarks. He said, I don't feel celeb celebratory. I only feel a sense of deep shame when I face you, my fellow citizens. We simply don't deserve this. We do not deserve another horrible election campaign that descends into filth like the one that ends today. End of quote. Where was the, the president coming from? Why did he make these remarks? What was he, what upset him? Um, you know, uh, there's a rivalry between uh, uh, the president, uh, Reuven Rivlin, and the prime minister, Bibi Netanyahu. And uh, indeed, the president accuses Netanyahu that because of his uh, positions and because of his greed, uh, and his uh, he intends to remain as prime minister forever. Uh, we are having these uh, elections three times in less of one year. So he made every possible effort in the last year just not to let a third run uh, to materialize and to have elections for the third time. So I think that's what he was talking about. Uh, in these uh, in these comments, uh, I I fully agree that the Israeli democracy democracy is in a in a terrible uh, collapse uh, because of different reasons. First of all, is that you know this division of around 50-50, um, where you have 50 percent extreme right supporting Netanyahu, whatever he does on the personal. Uh, level of corruption, uh, breach of trust, and all of the accusations against him that he's going to stand to trial in the, on the 17th of this uh, month. Uh, think about a prime minister going, uh, you know, once a week to the, uh, to the court, to the district court in Jerusalem, and then getting back to his office to run the state and probably to run the Middle East and probably to run the world, okay? So it's uh, a, a little bit, you know, um, tricky this uh, this matter. Uh, on the other side, the other uh, trouble with the Israeli democracy is that we are hearing now that uh, uh, the right wing Netanyahu personally, and not only Netanyahu, even Gantz, even the blue and right and white party, they are not considering the Arab citizens as a legitimate. Uh, player in the Israeli politics. And that's true, this remark about, you know, uh, the uh, Jewish vote, uh, that Netanyahu won the Jewish vote, which means that he won the elections, which is not true, of course. Uh, they speak openly about legitimate government. Legitimate government means that a government without the support of the Arab parties, even supporting the government from outside. So actually it's erasing, it's deleting the basic right of, of the democratic right of the Arab citizens. <clears throat> I mean, why should they, why should we allow them, why should the establishment allow them to go to vote when on the other day, tomorrow you will cancel their vote and you do not count them at all. Which means that the Israeli democracy is a hollow one. Uh, and that actually is materializing and is, uh, you know, uh, uh, this notion is evolving every, every day. Um, so uh, the, the president actually was trying to force the two major parties to have some sort of a national unity government. This option is still on the table uh, now. Uh, though uh, on the, uh, the other side, uh, Benny Gantz, the uh, blue and white party, they say we are not going to serve under prime minister with these accusations and sitting uh, to, to the court. Um, uh, probably one of the options now which, might, uh, which the president might push 
uh, is to have a, a national unity uh, headed uh, on the right wing party, not by Netanyahu, but a substitute uh, surrogate from the Likud party. Uh, he, he came from the Likud party, he knows the leadership of the Likud party, he has this his, uh, rivalry with uh, Bibi Netanyahu, but he has very good relations with, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the other leaders of, uh, uh, of the Likud party. This is, might be one of the options to, uh, uh, to evolve uh, in, the, in the coming days for establishing the, the next government. Uh, if, um, uh, I, I want to mention, it's, it's very important to mention here that one of the major results of these elections was the, the complete collapse of the Israeli uh, Zionist left. You know, the Labour Party, which is known historically for establishing the state of Israel, actually won with uh, a coalition with Meretz and with other, you know, members of the Knesset, with, our, with other parties, won only seven seats of, of, out of 120. It used to, uh, to win 60 and more seats in the Knesset, which means that this uh, Labour Party in Israel and all the, coalition, the coalitions which it formed with other parties, even with Meretz, which is the Zionist left, actually is collapsing completely. And that actually opens uh, the way for, uh, for uh, other coalitions, for new coalitions. Um, <clears throat> we are considering now, there is, there is a, a proposal now to establish some sort of a democratic camp with, uh, uh, with, with the Arab citizens, with the Arab parties, with the joint list in the, in the middle of it, and with Jewish support from liberals, from progressives, from left-leaning uh, Jewish voters. Uh, in these elections, the, uh, the votes which the joint list got from the uh, Jewish voters increased 100%. We had, it's not huge numbers, but it was something like um, 10,000 votes. Now we are talking about 20,000 votes which means that many in the Israeli left, uh, mainly the voters of uh, uh, Meretz, uh, with the coalition which Meretz formed with, uh, uh, with the Labour Party, they prefer to vote for the joint list because they think it actually uh, uh, represents them on political matters much more than this coalition of the Labour Party with Meretz. The one I would really like to focus on uh, is if we do the math, and you'd sort of broken it down for us at the outset in your remarks. You have Netanyahu's camp right now has 58 mandates. Uh, the uh, other block, uh, you, you described it as, as a block, actually has about 55, and then you have Lieberman, which is sitting there with, with uh, six or seven or so. Um, you know, there's going to be this stage now where uh, the various uh, lists and parties make their recommendations to the president about who should who should form a coalition. In uh, the last version uh, of, of the election, uh, when this played out, uh, this was a very contentious decision uh, among the uh, joint list, uh, but ultimately the decision was uh, made, uh, at least by the majority of the, the, the mandates in the list, uh, to recommend uh, that Gantz have the opportunity to form a government uh, to uh, to President Rivlin. Um, since then, um, you know, there's some time has passed. There's also been some additional things to take into consideration, including, for example, uh, where Gantz and, and others within his party uh, have been on things like the uh, Trump peace plan, uh, of course, which has been um, overwhelmingly rejected uh, by, uh, by Palestinians. Um, is is that something that might uh, fill, you know factor into the calculation of how uh, the list is going to decide whether or not they will ultimately make a recommendation to the president around whether or not Gantz should? My understanding from this morning is that Lieberman has announced his intention uh, to um, uh, recommend that that Gantz have that opportunity. 
to to uh, to the president. So the joint list is in a position here uh, to hand that opportunity uh, to Gantz. Is that something that you think the joint list would be comfortable with? Uh, and uh, what what might be the implications for that? Uh, in the previous elections, after the previous elections, it was uh, clear cut. I mean, it was very clear for everybody, and it was you know. Um, a, most of the Arab voters wanted the joint list to be part of creating the government, of establishing the government as a means of a, of having a impact uh, and try to affect the Israeli politics and the decision making in in Israel. Of course, seeking their interests of. Uh, uh, of uh, equality and fair share of resources and everything. And of course, for most the peace process and the peace of the Palestinians, uh, ending the occupation, everything. At least, you know, in these terms, to be involved mm -hmm. from the Israeli government, the uh, um, future Israeli gov government to be part or to be involved in the peace process. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, indeed, the joint list actually was, uh, you know, uh, very sensitive to this matter because, as I said, this is the, uh, the will of the voters, of the Arab voters, and they recommended, and the joint list recommended for the, uh, for the president to, um, to let a, a Benny Gantz establish the government. But after that, uh, uh, things developed not in the in the in the right direction, if I say, if I might say. And nowadays, I'm not sure that the joint list is going to repeat that position and recommend for the, the president to allow uh, Benny Gantz to form the uh, next government because of the position of. Uh, Benny Gantz regarding the uh, deal of the century, the Trump plan, uh, because, you know, he was not, he did not say clearly that he against, uh, the, uh, first of all, he said he agrees for the plan, he thinks it's great, but on the, on the part which, uh, which, which uh, is, in touch with the future of the Arab citizens, this land swap and the transfer actually of the Arab citizens, he didn't say anything about it until two days, three days before the elections in a very small, not in a Jewish setting, in an Arab setting, he said he cannot agree for, you know, forcing out Arab citizens out of the state of Israel. He put it in a way which is not clear, it's not political position that I'm not, I'm against it. So, uh, and, uh, you know, when Bibi Netanyahu was inciting against the role of the Arab citizens as part of the, of the, as legitimate part of the Israeli politics, he didn't say anything. When Bibi Netanyahu was saying that uh, if you vote for Benny Gantz, he will get the Arabs with him as part of the government, uh, he, he, Gantz did not say yes, that's fine and good, and I'll be happy with that. They are, you know, equal citizens. He didn't say anything about that. So actually, the position now is different, and I'm not sure. Probably, as we used to do in the past, we did not recommend for the president um, to uh, to ask this uh, camp or that camp camp to establish the government. So uh, I believe that uh, we don't, we, I know that there is no final uh, decision about that, but I believe that uh, mostly uh, the joint list will not recommend for the president for anybody of both things. Uh, probably it will be as we used to do that, uh, personality, a politician who will, uh, uh, lead the p real peace process, uh, lead uh, uh, you know, struggle for uh, equality for the Arab citizens in general terms, but not specifically, I think uh, Gantz lost a lot. Uh, I have to say that it's not only with the Arab voters mm -hmm. that Gantz uh, lost a lot, 
in these elections, even, even among the Jewish uh, electorate, he also lost because a lot because he was not firm in his positions and he was talking anti bb he was not talking politics he was not talking values he was not anti bb all the time anti bb is not politics is not strategy and he cannot be prime minister a real prime minister with this banner or slogan of anti bb alone if I may add, uh, I think I noticed uh, this morning an interview that took place uh, the last 24 hours with Ayman Odi, the head of the Arab list, and he was asked this, the same question. And uh, ironically, he gave a similar answer to what you just uh, gave us. And he said our endorsement of Gantz to form the next government is not automatic, and we are awaiting some clarification with regards to his position regarding the transfer of Arab citizens of Israel, and two, regarding his position on Palestinian statehood uh, and annexation. So short of that, uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't think that it, it's going to be uh, automatic. Uh, Hamza, yes. uh, you're a veteran of Israeli politics. Did these elections prove to you that there is a glass ceiling for Arabs in Israel? That's it. I mean, you can run, you can elect, you can vote, you can elect 15, 16. Uh, there will be probably 17 or 18 Arab members of the Knesset between uh, uh, the uh, joint list and, and the Jewish parties. Uh, but the Arabs, uh, according to the consensus, as you described it, by both, uh, uh, you know, white and blue on the one hand and Likud on the other, there is a limit that you are not considered a legitimate partner partner in the governance in, in Israel. Is that virtually your glass ceiling in Israel? Democracy is limited? Yes, yes. You know, that's, uh, that's what I said. Actually, uh, I fully agree with you. Uh, the Israeli democracy is, you know, is a deficient uh, democracy, uh, is a fluid one. And uh, yes, we have this uh, glass uh, ceiling. Uh, let me put it in another way uh, that, you know, um, the turnout uh, of the Arab voters in these elections actually was not meant really to uh, change the government or to be part of the government or the coming, the next government in Israel. It was actually uh, a challenge to Netanyahu and his incitement against the Arab citizens. The Arab citizens uh, felt very concerned of these positions and incitement of Netanyahu. They wanted to show unity. They wanted to show, uh, you know, belonging to this, you know, Palestinian uh, national uh, uh, flag, if I may say that. Uh, and to defend themselves. It's not uh, anymore after the positions of Netanyahu and of course of Gantz uh, that uh, the Arab citizens are seeking now you know, to be uh, represented in, in the government. We want to create this you know, strong uh, list, strong uh, political movement to defend our uh, very existence. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we know that the Israeli democracy is a fluid one. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, you know, there's a, in, in some time, uh, if creating a new government will depend on the Arabs, I think that uh, uh, Gantz will prefer to go with the Likud or with everybody else but not with the uh, Arab members of the Knesset. Let me remind you that within the uh, blue and white uh, party there are extremely right politicians and some of them who wrote this nationality law, the Jewish nationality law, uh, uh, like you as Hendel and Tzvika Hauser, they were, you know, aides of Netanyahu previously and they are uh, ultra right, uh, right, right wing. And they are part of the uh, blue and white party. And I don't believe in any, under any conditions that they might live with the Arabs 
uh, as members of the press or even supporting uh, a government from the uh, outside. So uh, for myself and for many uh, Arab activists, these are uh, another time there are more and more proofs that, uh, uh, that the Israeli democracy is not serving our, you know, our intentions, our positions and our vision. And that's, that's good. I mean, I know that you know that there are uh, Arab citizens who do not vote, who do not participate and even preach against that. And uh, they, are, they were active against being part of, you know, in, in turning out and in voting in these elections and the previous elections. But let me emphasize that for the majority of the Arab citizens, participating in the elections is becoming more to defend yourself and to create some sort of uh, individual you know, existence more than the, the intention to be part of the Israeli politics. I just wanted to, to follow up on, on this uh, question around Arab turnout and sort of how um, how you capitalize on that on that momentum so that 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 glass ceiling maybe is not as as much of an issue. Um, you know, it, the turnout that we saw among you know the the Palestinian citizens of Israel was was pretty historic in the recent context. Um, but uh, we have also seen high turnout previously. Uh, you know, in the, in the nineteen nineties and so on. Um, but there uh, seemed to uh, be after that a certain turn away from participation uh, in the system, maybe because people felt like they weren't able to get anything out of it or that there was really uh, no point in, in, uh, in participating. And also because maybe, you know, MKs who lent their support to certain Israeli governments in the past felt that, that they got burned for that. Uh, if you are looking at this moment where you have um, this very significant Arab turnout, this uh, pretty historic result in terms of the joint list's number of mandates. And you are thinking about how do you capitalize on this so that the voters that came out uh, in support of the list come out again in the future and do not get demoralized about participation? Uh, and how, how do you weigh sort of the, the challenges of getting involved with or supporting, uh, you know, a, a party like Gantz, uh, if it may mean bringing an end to, you know, Netanyahu and one of the most, uh, one of the loudest sort of voices of anti-Arab incitement, you know, in, in Israel. Uh, but the flip side of that uh, could be that you end up seeing a replay of what it meant to support uh, Israeli, uh, you know, Zionist parties historically, uh, getting burned, not feeling that they held up their end of the bargain uh, and end up seeing people dejected because of that. How, how in this moment do you navigate between those things and figure out what is the best to continue to get the community energized and engaged in supporting uh, the, the political uh, parties? You know, in the elections a uh, year ago, the turnout was about uh, 49, 50 percent uh, because uh, the Arab parties ran in, in two heads, in two uh, parties, in two lists. Uh, once they, um, they ran together in September, the participation increased uh, to about 60 uh, percent. Uh, in the last elections a few days ago, the participation actually grew to about 67, 66% among the Arab voters. In general, in Israel, the turnout this time was 71%, which is an increase of 2% over uh, compared with the uh, September elections, which was 69%, which means that, you know, a, the participation among the Arabs increased and among the Jews, the right-wing Jews, which were, you know, uh, uh, were actually the answer of Netanyahu's wishes to go out and vote uh, in, in crowds, in droves, how uh, Netanyahu put it once in the, in the past. Um, so actually, uh, I would say that Arabs, Arab voters would prefer, first of all, a united, united uh, list, United Party. Uh, this gives them confidence 
this gives gives them a uh, power uh, and actually uh, it uh, uh, it answers their wishes to have more impact in the israeli politics it doesn't mean to be part of the government but you know to be uh, the third party in the knesset that's good for every Arab that actually is, you know, is happy about that to be a major player in the Israeli Knesset. Uh, it doesn't mean also, uh, as I said, in the Israeli as as part of the Israeli government. Let me talk openly about this, you know, this, you know, wishful thinking of being a part of the Israeli government. I would put it from the other side. I cannot serve, I cannot really support an Israeli government which commits, you know, uh, occupation uh, and the discrimination against the Arab uh, citizens uh, in, in, in Israel. I mean, it's not a matter only for the Jewish parties to accept me or not to accept me, okay? They might, you know, uh, uh, once Rabin, actually, in the mid-90s, uh, he wanted to, the Arab members of the Knesset, there were very few, four or five of them. He wanted them, he wanted them to support his government because he really wanted to make some sort of peace with the Palestinians. But nowadays with Netanyahu and with Gantz, they don't count the Arabs. And they are not going to change their major politics and strategies towards the Palestinians and towards the Middle East in general, both of them agreed and accepted the, the deal of the century by, by Trump. So there are no uh, real differences in the intentions and the political intentions towards the Palestinians for the major parties in Israel and the major camps in Israel. So for us as citizens of the state, I think that our destiny is to remain a struggling uh, minority to struggle for uh, achieving peace with the Palestinians, to end the occupation, to have equality for our people. Even if we could get from the prime minister or the new coalition, uh, you know, um, a, a position or policies of equality inside, let, let's let's say that we could agree on that. But the other day, they, there are raids on Gaza and killing people and, you know, uh, occupation in, in the West Bank and with every everything that accompanies the, the occupation. We cannot accept that. And the other day, tomorrow, we will, you know, we will dissolve. We will get out of the, of the government. So I think it's not viable to be part of the Israeli government under the current conditions. So I, what I think that more and more we are about uh, to adopt as our policy is to, uh, to struggle more, to have more uh, rights, more equality as citizens of the state, and accepting the situation uh, not accepting, actually challenging the, uh, the the position that we are second order uh, in the count of uh, impact on the Israeli politics and as part of legitimate legitimate participants in the Israeli government. I think it's a it's a tricky uh, for myself and for many politicians who I know. Uh, that's the position. We are not happy to be part of the Israeli government. We want our rights, we want equality, but not to be members of the Israeli government under the current situation of occupation and of not allowing the Palestinian people to have their you know, uh, right of independence. By virtue of uh, sitting here in a room in Washington, uh, four blocks or so from the White House, uh, did uh, the uh, Trump plan really uh, play a role, direct role, or impact, particularly the Arab vote? I know you alluded to the fact that both camps in, 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 the, in the Jewish sector kind of accepted it, uh, and that probably played a role in the elections. But uh, how about the, its impact on the Arab voters? The Arab world? 
the Arab voters. The yeah, those who oh, Arab voters. Yeah. Um, actually, this was one of the reasons why uh, the Arab voters were concerned. Actually, because you know this plan talk especially about you know all of the triangle region to be transferred uh, to the Palestinian authority which means that they are going to lose their Israeli uh, rights Israeli uh, citizenship and actually everybody felt that this is you know the the price that Israel or the currency that Israel is paying for holding the settlements. Actually, we are paying, uh, they are part of the demographic uh, balance uh, game, and that Israel is really interested in getting rid of the, uh, of the Palestinian citizens. And actually, that uh, made a huge impact on the Arab voters, and many of them uh, participated because of this concern about what the uh, century of the deal, the Trump's plan actually uh, wanted or uh, 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 took them into consideration. I want to mention something here also, which is, you know, eventually it's not only for the Arab voters, for the Israeli society in general. You know, eventually what will make difference is what's going to happen in November this year in the United States. Because everybody knows here in Israel, you know, these major decisions on, you know, on general and regional political decisions, whether, you know, annexation or uh, is, is Palestinian state or not a Palestinian state, uh, the Jordan Valley, not the Jordan Valley. We know exactly that the Israeli government actually uh, abides by by what what is decided and what's the will of the uh, White House. So the Israeli uh, elections are very important and their uh, results are very important. But the most important thing in the in the near future is the, what will happen in November, whether President Trump will have uh, will succeed again or whether we have a substitute from the Democratic Party, where we have increasing votes from uh, voices from the Democratic Party, talking about, you know, just peace, about, you know, Netanyahu as a racist and, uh, uh, and reactionary uh, politician, uh, you know, by Sanders, uh, even Joe Biden, despite the fact that he's a good friend of, uh, of, uh, of Israel in general, uh, but uh, he is insisting the two-state solution, um, uh, which was uh, ripped out by the, uh, the, the uh, Trump plan. So let's uh, I, we still wait until November. What happens? And very important things could happen in uh, November than what happened in these elections. Now, these elections, uh, this third election now in Israel actually were about whether Netanyahu is going to surrender and go to jail, or he is going to survive and, and be prime minister for other three, four years. I, I see uh, this morning in the Israeli media all kinds of news about the possibility of legislation to block the possibility by, of the president asking Netanyahu to form the next government because of the legal charges against him. I know that legally in Israel, you cannot prevent a sitting prime minister from continuing uh, to govern if indicted. But you can probably, or there is a debate, whether you can prevent somebody who is not a sitting prime minister from, and that's probably the purpose of this uh, legislation. Do you think it has a chance to pass? Uh, not really, because, you know, uh, the blue and white are really uh, coward parliamentarians. They already withdrew from this possibility. And, you know, there is a rule in the Israeli uh, parliament that you do not uh, enact personal laws. And the, everybody understands that this law is actually directed towards Netanyahu. So this is a uh, personal, uh, personal law. So I don't think that 
will will really uh, succeed. I think that uh, uh, there will be no such law. Uh, and uh, uh, everybody is thinking now about the position of the High Court in Israel because you know everybody is throwing this hot potato on the High Court of Israel. Let the justices decide about that because the people, the voters are not deciding. They are half 50-50 almost. So everybody is, uh, you know, is craving, is, uh, you know, interested in that the uh, High Court will solve the, this problem. The, whole, the High Court, I'm sure, will not solve this problem, and it will uh, uh, put it back to the, to the political uh, arena. And uh, eventually, let me give you my, uh, I think that eventually we will have some sort of a national unity uh, government with a, a, with a, a blue and white, with a Likud, either under the leadership of Netanyahu or other person from uh, the Likud, they will form a, a government. That's, uh, that's what I think will, will happen because the Israeli establishment in general, the wise men in Israel will not allow uh, fourth elections in one year and they want to form a government uh, in any price, in any way. And that's what I think that there will be more and more pressure put by the president and other wise men in Israel to force these two major parties to create and to form this new, new government. That's what I think. Probably if Netanyahu would uh, remain, he will not remain a prime minister. At least they will have, you know, um, uh, this, uh, uh, a, Two, two halves, two terms, uh, and uh, probably Gantz will start as prime minister, and then Netanyahu will run his, uh, his court, his charges, uh, and probably if he's uh, acquitted, he will uh, come back. If not, he will go to jail. That's what I think is, is going to happen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Swade, for uh, spending uh, this uh, precious hour uh, with us. Uh, I, I, uh, I know your schedule is very tight and appreciate uh, your willingness thank you. uh, to join us today. So thank you on behalf of the staff here at Arab Center and on behalf of our guests today uh, for, for this uh, time that you chose uh, to help us understand the complex situation in Israel. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. In the future. Thank you. Thank you.